people, but you can't build a bridge between your sheep and a wolf so the wolf can come in and, and eat your sheep. Friends, I got a great video for you today, but before we get into that, I want to show you my new book, Another Gospel, A Lifelong Christian Seeks Truth in Response to Progressive Christianity. It's coming out very soon, and I want to let you know about a couple of bonuses you can claim if you pre-order the book. So if you've already pre-ordered the book, you're getting the bonuses. If you pre-order between now and October 6th at midnight, you're getting the bonuses, which are, number one, you're going to get the first two chapters of the book a week early. And number two, you're going to be eligible to join a special private Facebook book club group led by me where we will take six weeks to read through the book together. And at the end of each week, I'll do a Facebook live in that group where I'll teach through the chapters we read. I'll take your questions. We'll have a great discussion. So if this sounds great to you, if you want to be a part of that, go to alisachilders.com slash another gospel, and you can click a link to pre-order on all kinds of different platforms. Then below that, there's a link to click where you'll fill out a form with your receipt number and you'll get to be a part of the Facebook group and you'll get those two chapters early. I would really love for you to be a part of this. So please go to alisachilders.com slash another gospel, pre-order and join us on Facebook. It's going to be fun. Here with Krista Bontrager from Theology Mom and Monique Dusan from the Center for Biblical Unity. Together, they have a great podcast called All the Things. And when does that, that live stream, uh, tell, Sa tell Saturday us Saturday nights. Awesome. What time? Depends on where you are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Saturday night at 6 p.m. Pacific time and according to your time zone. Yes, so you can Eastern. Google your time zone yes. based on that. Yes. So we're going to talk about unity today because uh, all three of us tend to say some controversial things. I've been known to have <laughs> a controversial thought or two. Just sometimes. And so when you're, when you're writing blog posts and doing podcasts that have some controversial material, in my case, I'm uh, kind of regularly speaking out against progressive Christianity, and Krista and Monique do a lot of work addressing uh, the false ideas of critical theory and critical race theory, as well as other false doctrines. You've yeah. talked about progressives, and Krista was actually on a podcast episode with me to talk about mops. He was mops going progressive. And of course, Monique was on to talk about critical theory. So we are no strangers to getting emails from people who are upset by what we say or, uh, but, but one of the sort of common themes seems to be that we'll, we'll all get emails that say, Hey, we need to be unified as Christians. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is, you know, by calling out some of these things, it's causing people to divide from each other. And of course, Jesus in uh, John 17 prayed that we would all be one. So he wants unity and we want unity. So we're going to talk about the difference between superficial unity and genuine biblical unity. And so, uh, Krista, I'll start with you. You've been doing this a really long time. Yeah, about two and a half decades. Yeah, been that's a long time. Slugging it out. Yeah. And so I, I want to ask you your opinion. Basically, when you're getting emails from people that are saying these kind of things, what are some general thoughts that come to your mind about, first of all, like, what is biblical unity? Yeah. And does that mean unity at all costs? Yeah, that's a really good question because I see a couple of kinds of letters that we get. One is, like you said, people who are concerned that we are being divisive. The other kind are people who are concerned about progressive Christianity or critical race theory coming into their church. They want to know how to have a conversation with their pastor about it. And then the pastor comes back and says, we don't want to talk about this mm. publicly because then it's going to divide our church. It's going to split our church. And so they're concerned that bringing in these conversations from you or from us is going to end up splitting the church. And so the question of what is unity, I think that when we see unity, a really good place to go for a criteria is Ephesians chapter 4, where it talks about how Christians can be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. And what is it that unifies us? It, it talks there in Ephesians chapter 4 about the knowledge of Christ and how when we grow in maturity, that is how unity comes. That God has given us um, 
pastors, teachers, evangelists to to equip us for the works of ministry, to grow us into maturity, the knowledge of Christ, and that how does that come? It's really through what unites our beliefs. Mm. And that has no skin color. Truth has no skin color. That is true, authentic biblical unity is having like-mindedness about what we believe. Yeah. And in particular, about, about the gospel. Right. So Monique, when you're looking at some of these emails, and I, I, we were talking about this earlier, that you're getting a lot of emails from people who are just desperate because maybe critical race theory is making inroads in their church, and they're seeing people scattering on different sides. Talk a little bit. We've talked about critical race theory on my podcast before, but how is that specifically dividing the church? And you know, some people would say, well, no, it's talking about it that's dividing the church. But you, you are actually saying, no, it's actually this ideology that's coming in that's dividing. And I think progressive Christianity is the same way. So talk a little bit about your impressions of getting some of these emails and, and what you think the true culprit is for the division. Well, I think that people are approaching the, the, the subject of critical race theory as either we can talk about it or we can't. Like just the, the, the subject itself is bad and not understanding that people within the church are actually adopting a framework. And by not talking about it, we're not alerting people to the true problems within the framework and how, in my opinion, it is antithetical to the gospel. And so we are allowing people to now live in this false hope that a secular framework is really going to build unity. Mm. The framework, though, never really gets us to unity because it focuses on oppressed and oppressor. Mm. And so we are adopting a false ideology and a false identity um, as Christians when we adopt this framework. And so what I'm seeing is, you know, pastors or leaders saying, well, I don't want to talk about this because I don't want to make people upset. If I talk about this, then people are going to split. But what they're not understanding is that people are, are splitting anyway. People yeah. are saying, I adopt this. And because I adopt this, I automatically see you as the oppressor, or I see you as being oppressed. And we participate with one another from that construct or from that starting point, instead of identifying and, and participating with one another based on our identity as brothers and sisters first. Mm. We can have conversations about injustice and racism and things like that, but we need to do it from the premise that we are first brothers and sisters and we come to the table from an equal starting point. Mm. Without that, division is going to occur. If, if, if you address critical race theory in your church and people don't, you know, people aren't on board with critical race theory, they're going to self-select out. Mm. But if you don't address critical race theory in your church, people will become divisive automatically. But it'll just be kind of behind it'll, closed it'll doors. It'll be behind closed yeah. doors. Yeah. Yes. And then people will self-select onto what side of the fence they're going to land on. Mm. And so there's there's a division that is happening either way. I would much rather have a division based on um, clear doctrine. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't want the church to split. I don't want there to be division. But if we're going to have it anyway, mm -hmm. I would much rather say, look, this is the clear doctrine. This is the truth of scripture. Choose what side you're going to stand on based on the historic Christian faith, the what we have always believed and what the scriptures have historically um, said. Yeah. I think that's a really important point is we're trying to stand in the line of 2000 years mm -hmm. of the historic Christian faith. And the work that you do, Elisa, the work that we do is to call our attention to what have Christians historically believed mm -hmm. about these points? The division is coming in with these new ideas. Yes. That's where the division is. Mm -hmm. But yet we're the ones who are constantly having to defend ourselves as yeah. being divisive. But I think really in this cultural moment, what it's going to take is a lot of pastors having some moral courage mm -hmm. to say, here's where we're going to draw the line. And, and we're going to stand in unity with 2,000 years of church history 
and we're not going to let these new doctrines come into our, our local church. Exactly. And, and as you're, you're talking, both of you, it's just, it's got me thinking about the fact that Christianity is exclusive, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. To become a Christian, you are essentially choosing a side. It forces you to do that, yeah. to put yeah. your trust in Jesus and to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. That requires a choice that you're choosing him over everything else, ultimately. Mm-hmm. And so that's why, it, you know, what like what you mentioned, when the new ideas come in that that are threatening that, that's when we have to call those things out. In fact, I, I was just looking up this verse in Titus about a church elders, and it says that an elder must hold firm to the uh, trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict yes. it. So part, part of the qualification for a church elder is to call out false doctrine and actually to rebuke people who are trying to bring those new and different ideas into the church. It's actually his job to do that. Yeah. And it's not divisive to do that. It's actually protecting the unity yes. of the church to say, no, we're not going to let this just become a big, a mixed bag of ideas and everybody gets to kind of follow their conscience and do what they want. Yeah. It's actually church leaders' job. So I love what you said about pastors having the moral courage to, to stand up against the ideas of progressive Christianity. But yeah, just an encouragement to pastors and church leaders to, to really take the Bible at its word. And, and it's your job to, to stand up against these false ideas that are trying to come in to the church because ultimately those ideas are going to divide the church. And it's interesting too that Paul put the blame of division on the ones bringing in the false yeah. doctrine. I think mm. it's a really important point because the letters that we're getting from pastors pastoral staff are telling us, you know, well, how can we keep our church unified but not have these hard conversations? Yes. Mm. That's not possible. Mm. Yes. That is to ask an impossible request. What what we need are elders and pastors to get clarity about doctrine and to say, here's what we're going to be about and allowing people that are progressive or into critical race theory to self-select out of the church in that local church and saying, well, I don't, you know, I have a different belief system. That's fine. You can, you can go do your own thing, but this is what we're going to be about. And some pastors, quite honestly, they're going to have to be willing to fire some people. They've hired some Mm. staff that are now they're realizing are sympathetic to these outside ideas. They might have to find moral courage to fire some people. Mm. And that's not divisive. That's preserving mm. the unity of the gospel. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. It's, you know, there's one thing to, to you know, want to understand and have a heart for people who may have, you know, inadvertently stepped into progressive Christianity or into CRT and, you know, you're having conversations with them and things like that. But it's something completely different when people on your team or your staff are now wanting to openly and publicly proclaim the tenets of critical mm-hmm. race theory. It's it's about having those hard conversations. And at some point, if someone says, you know, I, well, I'm not going to self-select out, I'm going to continue to stay on and proclaim what I believe is truth, you know, that hard conversa- conversation of saying not here, not today, because I am going to stand for the gospel. I am going to stand for the historic Christian faith. We have to get into a place of being able to say, you know what, I'm going to have a bold and hard conversation and it's not going to feel good. And I know some people are going to be upset. And yet this is what we have believed for the last 2000 years. So it's, it's going to take that moral courage, like you're saying, of standing up and saying, no, not today, Satan. We're not going <laughs> to... We're not going to come in through the back door. I'm not going to allow this to creep in. I'm not going going to be, um, for lack of a better word, sheepish in my approach. Tolerant. Tolerant. Yes, we have to have those hard conversations and being willing to stand up and say, look, I know that you think that truth can only come through this or through, you know, a person of color or through this type of revelation. But that's not scripture. That's not what what the Bible says. Yeah. Or there there is no objective truth. Mm-hmm. You know, it's all about my truth and my experience as a person of color. Well, that isn't, you know, according to scripture. So you're either going to have to get on board or I have to understand that we are now having an interfaith conversation. Mm. This is your outside of orthodoxy. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And if you're outside of orthodoxy, then we need to have different conversations. Yeah. You know, it's interesting when you're talking about, and we, we brought up tolerance because one of the striking verses to me in the Bible is in Revelation and the letters to the churches where Jesus actually condemns, I think it was Thyatira, he condemns them for the sin of tolerance mm. because they're tolerating this woman Jezebel um, who was drawing people into sexual immorality and Jesus actually condemns them for being tolerant. And, you know, can I can I say something that's probably not going to be very popular? But... I might have to fan you. Okay. <laughs> get your fan ready, maybe, or we'll just get lots more emails. I don't know. But... What we're talking about is not going to work in the in the mega church model that seeks to grow in numbers as their primary goal. Ooh, I mean, right? We might have to fan I'm you. I'm gonna fan you a little bit because I, I know that some people they gonna they gonna push back on that. Yeah, but it's exactly. true. It's so <laughs> real. Gonna... Like you can't think that, and you know. Mm-hmm. Pardon me if you are a seeker friendly, you know, congregation, but you can't be seeker friendly to the point that you're willing to yeah, put to compromise. Yeah, to compromise. Yeah. You yeah. can't do that at the expense of the gospel. The gospel doesn't change. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's a hard issue because we want to be oriented toward how do we proclaim the gospel? How do we reach people yes. that that haven't yet um given their allegiance to Jesus and are living for him. And and that's an important conversation for a local church to have. At the same time, we don't want that to negate the hard discussions that we have as a leadership team Mm -hmm. of what we are going to stand for. And if we're going to talk about unity, we're going to have to talk about unity of thought, unity of mind, unity of, of doctrine. And what are those things that have united Christians for two thousand yeah. years, and we that's going to have to be aligned. That you know, you know, yeah, we have evangelism, and we're going to proclaim the gospel, but we're not going to do it this way. Yeah. So well, and I'm also just as I think about false teachings and false doctrines and what the Bible has to say about that. For for the book that I just wrote, I just I spent tons of time just researching all of the Bible verses that have to do with that issue. And, you know, in Matthew 7, Jesus compares false teachers with wolves. Mm-hmm. And and so when you think about he's comparing his followers and his flock to sheep, well, what's the predator of a sheep? It's a wolf. And so when we get emails from people saying things like, you know, we need to build bridges, which, yes, in certain contexts, we do want to build bridges. Of mm-hmm. course, we want to give people a way across to come right. to, yes. the, to the gospel. But you can't build a bridge between your sheep and a wolf so the wolf can come in and, and eat your sheep. And so I think that, you know, when you think about, you know, you're not going to invite a wolf to sit at your table. So I think there's a difference between building a bridge with a, a, a person who's a little lost and confused and you're trying to, to help them understand the gospel. There's a difference between that and then literally building a bridge with someone who's trying to come in and pick off your sheep. And and essentially that that is going to split the church. And, and so it's... It's a tough, it's a very tough topic because we all want unity, right? Mm -hmm. That is what we want. And so, Monique, how can churches, because I think a lot of this is motivated from a genuine heart to try to do better than we've done in the past. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of these conversations that are happening in churches are coming from a place where people are maybe waking up to the reality of racism for the first time or something along those lines. But What's a better way? What what can churches do to rightly recognize uh, sins in their church or sins in their that you know that are going on at the present time? Um, but but do that, but avoid the false ideologies of critical theory and and even progressive Christianity, which they can be an on on ramp to each other. Yeah. Really, I think. I know it it might be like an oversimplification, but it's just about doing that. Like hold to scripture, hold to what doctrine says, what unifies us, being clear on our doctrine first, and then yeah, have the hard conversations. This is where we've been. This is our history as a nation. Our history is ugly. Like we can, Mm -hmm. we can look at that. There's nothing I think in scripture and we, um, Krista and I talk about this. There's nothing in scripture when we look at Israel that, um, that hides Israel's sin. Mm. So we see her as a prize and we see her as a prostitute. 
That's fine. We can see America in her greatness and we can see America in the ugliness of her racism. That's that's fine. We can have that conversation. We can have conversations about how we got here as a nation. What what are some of the things that have led to um, the anger of in minority communities? What are some of the things that have led to separations within the church? You know, having a black church and a white church, what got us there? But we can't do that and withhold doctrine. Mm. We can't say, well, you know, in order to appease this group or in order to make this group not feel so alienated, we are going to now leave out a piece of truth. Mm. We have to come to the table with truth. Everyone has to come to the table with truth first because that's what's going to unify us. That's what's going to say, hey, I see you as my sister or brother. It doesn't matter what color you are. Yeah, we've had some we've had some history. We've had some very rough history. But how are we going to walk from this point on together? We're going to walk from this point on together in the doctrine that has unified us, that has called us together as Christians for the last 2000 plus years. Now, we can talk about this issue over here. Well, I see this as as being an injustice. Scripturally, is that an injustice? How are we defining our terms? What are we what are we considering justice and injustice? But we we can't move forward if we don't understand some of the basic tenets. They're they're like ground rules for a family. Mm. What are the mm. ground rules for me to be able to participate in this family? It's good. Once I understand that, then I can walk with you forward. But right now we are adopting different ground rules into the family. We've, we were given our, our ground rules. Paul tells us if, if there's been anything, you know, um, encouraging in, in your Christianity, in your walk, then keep the unity by being like-minded, being humble, on and on and on. He's given being us patient, our, being, being patient. Gentle. Yes. He's given us our ground rules for how to participate with one another. And so as we use those rules to participate and move forward, we can have those other conversations. Mm -hmm. But if I don't have the rules straight first and I just jump to the conversations, I'm not going to treat you as a brother or sister. I'm going to treat you as an outsider, as somebody from the street that I might not know, which is going to give me reason or um, permission to be able to cuss you out or mm -hmm. to treat you with partiality treat and treat others with favoritism because I don't really identify with you as being my brother or sister. I like to think of a metaphor of, of music. You know, I've got a background in music because sometimes when we talk about rules like ground rules and doctrines. People are like, ah, doctrine, that just sounds so like intolerant and all of these things. But if you think about a beautiful piece of music, um, that beautiful piece of music is only going to sound beautiful if everybody's following the rules. And in music, the rules are the notes. You know, my husband's a drummer. If, if he's not keeping time, really pretty rigidly, then the rest of the band is going to sound off. It's going to sound like a mess. It's not going to sound pleasing. It's not going to reach your soul. It's not going to uh, make you relate emotionally with what they're doing because it's just like this, this clatter. And so, you know, I think sometimes when we think about doctrine, we think about like, it's like these boxes or these intellectual propositions that people are just giving intellectual assent to. But I like to think of it like music. It's mm. actually making the song beautiful mm. to have the guidelines laid out and say, everybody flow like this. And that's what's going to be the most beautiful. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, I, like that. I like that. I like that a lot. I think I, I would say I could think about it like dance, yeah. you know, um, in much the same way. Like if you don't have the posture right, if your feet aren't positioned right and you go to do something, um, it, it looks weird. Mm -hmm. You know, it, yeah. it's, it's not pleasing aesthetically to the eye. Yeah. yeah. I think for me, doctrine brings clarity. Mm. Oh, we need clarity. And yeah. so there's so much confusion out there right now. Well, what do I believe? How do I know what's true? How do I, how do I figure this out? To me, understanding what I believe and being able to, um, know what that is at the foundation, it just brings so much clarity. And it's like, okay, now here's what I believe. Here's who I am in Christ. Now I can look at these more complex issues, but I have a solid lens through yeah. which to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's an important conversation. I am all for unity, but I am for 
real unity, authentic yeah. unity based on 2000 years of uh, Christian history, not unity just where we're going to superficially, we're just not going to talk about things. We're just going to all come in the same building and be polite to each other <laughs> on Sunday. That's not real unity. Yeah. So. That's like a shopping mall. You can do that at a shopping yeah. mall. You can all come together and just be nice and polite. And yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you enjoyed listening to or watching this podcast, you can go to alisachilders.com and click the subscribe button, or you can subscribe on YouTube or iTunes or wherever it is that you're listening to this podcast. Don't forget to go to patreon.com slash alisachilders and take a look at some of the ways that you can come alongside us financially and with your prayers to help get the message out to more people. Have a great week.